Good evening. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. December 5th, 2013, South China Sea. The People's Republic of China's PLA Navy Liaoning, the one and only carrier in possession of the Chinese Communist Party, which controls and owns the Navy, is proceeding south with escort craft for shakedown crews. The USS Kalpins, a guided missile cruiser, is following along in train in the South China Sea, open waters. What happens then is alarming and requires interpretation. Gordon Chang of Forbes.com, my colleague and co-host, joins me. He's traveling. He's in Canada. Gordon, a very good evening to you. Good evening, John. Gordon, the USS Kalpins incident is similar but much more severe than the incident of several years past. There have been previous incidents where the the PLA Navy has come close or challenging to craft in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. Uh, What's striking about the Kalpins, Gordon, is that this happened while the vice president is in China. Is that significant, Gordon? Well, it certainly is significant, John, because that is not a coincidence. I think what's going on here is that the Chinese military has sort of driven policy right now, and they're saying to the civilians, look, you can talk to Biden or you can talk to a Biden or Merkel, but we're going to do what we want to royal relations. And that shows, I think, the weakness of Xi Jinping. We welcome Professor Toshio Shahara. Uh, Toshi is a professor at the Naval War College. He is also the author with his colleague James Holmes of Red Star Over the Pacific, a prescient book describing the ambitions of the PLA Navy, China's rise and the challenge to U.S. maritime strategy. Professor, a very good evening to you. The Kalpins incident, as presented in the Stars and Stripes in the reporting of these last days, says that a Chinese military ship came within 500 yards of Kalpins and it had to divert its course. Is 500 yards close? Is this dangerous? Can we take this as a moment when the U.S. Navy woke up? Good evening to you, Toshi. Good evening. Um, It's not very clear how fast um, either of those uh, ships were uh, cruising at, but for a ship of the Kalpin size, the Kalpin displaces uh, about 10,000 tons. It's a very large ship, which means that for a large ship like that, it's very hard to turn and it's very hard to stop. So in nautical terms, 500 yards is uh, very, very close. Uh, People have said that this, depending on the speed again, it may have given one side or the other somewhere around maybe 10 or 20 seconds to avoid a collision. So this could have been a serious accident had it occurred. Uh, Professor, does this look like bad seamanship on the part of the PLA Navy or purposeful? It seems to me that this was fairly purposeful. Uh, My understanding is that uh, the the ship maneuvered uh, in the way, in the path uh, of the Kalpins, forcing Kalpins to engage in evasive maneuvers. Now, in terms of how... um, major warships should operate at sea is that they should not affect each other's ability to operate freely on the high seas. And what the Chinese did clearly was a violation of um, freedom of navigation. And that is why I think we were making a big deal out of this, because it violated a key principle of the freedom of um, warships, essentially, to navigate and travel freely. Gordon? Well, Toshi, I've heard reports that this was not 500 yards, but that this was actually 200 yards. But we'll drop that for the moment. But the thing, the question I have on my mind is that next year the Navy is going to be hosting the RIMPAC 2014 exercises off Hawaii with many of our allies and friends. And China has been invited to participate in RIMPAC 2014. Why do we extend an invitation to a country that almost causes a collision at sea? This just seems to me to be nuts. Right. Um, it seems to me that the, that our invitation that we extended for China to participate in RIMPAC was to uh, increase our and to improve our military-to-military relationship. Um, and I think that uh, that is certainly an olive branch that we, you know, have the right to withdraw, that, uh, you know, we should, we could potentially disinvite China for essentially um, challenging the principles of cooperation among the world's navies. And so, um, on the one hand, I think, you know, this, the, 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 the uh, RIMPACT shows the limits of what we can do in terms of our military-to-military relationship, but that this also gives us some leverage if we wanted to use it. 
The South China Sea, uh, the East China Sea, both these are the bastion seas, if I remember correctly, Professor, from your book, and the Chinese uh, PLA Navy regards it as home waters. They're going to project power, they're making claims of air zones, and they're making claims of violence. The U.S. Navy does not acknowledge either of those. So, if this escalation is today, December 5th, while the Vice President of the United States is in Beijing, can we expect that there'll be other incidents Toshi, what's the buzz in the naval uh, quarters? I think it seems to me that as China's naval power grows, uh, China's naval presence in those waters will certainly increase. On the other hand, the United States Navy uh, insists on the principle of freedom of navigation that gives the United States the maneuver room to operate forward in Asian waters to maintain stability. And so I think the United States Navy will not back off from that principle and will continue to conduct essentially a freedom of, uh, of uh, navigation operation simply to make the principal point that the United States and all other seafaring nations reserve the right to do so. And what that means, of course, is that greater contact with the Chinese Navy and increased frequency of these types of encounters. And again, um, if the Chinese continue to uh, act in this way, then I'm afraid that more tensions are uh, in the future. Gordon, does it benefit uh, Beijing, these incidents? No, actually, I don't think that it does. You know, if you take the narrative that China is a rising power, they should be taking the same position that we do, that basically the seas are, uh, the seas are open and free for everybody. That's what a strong power does. That's what the United States has done for more than two centuries, as Toshi has pointed out. We have stood for freedom of navigation. That is the one constant in American diplomacy from the very beginning of our country, because we have believed that we are strong and that we believe that this is the right uh, policy for the world. China is doing everything that is counterproductive. You know, Barbara Tuckman talked about folly. This is a policy of folly for Beijing. I read a quote from the Stars and Stripes piece, Toshi. This is from a defense official commenting in an email to Stars and Stripes, the newspaper of record for about most of the 20th century for a military of forces overseas and at home. Whether it is a tactical at sea encounter or strategic dialogue, sustained and reliable communication mitigate risk of mishaps, which is in the interest of both the U.S. and China. Okay, translation. Does that mean that there was no communication going on when this that it happened, or that the Chinese ignored the warnings from the Kalpins Bridge? My understanding is that there were, in fact, uh, proper communications between the commanding officers of the two ships, and then they kind of negotiated their way out of that particular incident. Um, I think that there is an attempt right now to kind of downplay the incident on both sides, both from the U.S. side and from the Chinese side, I think primarily because they want to preserve uh, still a very fragile military-to-military -military relationship. But again, I wonder whether uh, we've got this backwards, because it seems to me um, that uh, if China continues to insist uh, that uh, it has its prerogatives in those near seas, uh, I'm afraid that uh, no amount of military-to-military -military relationship will resolve this fundamental difference in world views about U.S. and Chinese prerogatives in Asian waters. Gordon, one, one more question, quickly, please. Uh, Toshi, people say that we should have an incident at sea agreement with China. But what it really means, I think, is that China should just observe the rules of the road. It's as simple as that. That's right. Um, as long as the Chinese, uh, you know, basically act like a grown-up at sea and observe, essentially, what has been established international custom at sea, then we wouldn't need an incident at sea agreement. And by the way, we have actually on paper a maritime military consultative uh, committee that was designed to resolve these issues that was signed more than a decade ago, but that's just ink on a piece of paper. It has never been exercised in, in any meaningful sense, again, because the Chinese fundamentally disagree with our freedom to maneuver in what they consider to be their backyard. Toshi, just quickly, have you seen any indication that the skipper or the people on the bridge of the Kalpins have been disciplined in any fashion for their conduct in this incident? Uh, there's no evidence of that, and from what I can tell, there was nothing that they did wrong. I think they were, they were, you know, doing what they were supposed to be doing, which is operating and exercising their freedom on the high seas. Gordon, what is the probability that the captain of the Chinese ship acted independently of Beijing? Oh, about zero. 
Maybe uh, less than zero. Got it. Gordon Chang of Forbes.com, my colleague and co-host, and we thank Professor Toshi Oshihara of the U.S. Naval War College. Toshi with his colleague James Holmes, authors of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise, and The Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.